Okay. okay. Cool. I'll go first. Um, I'm Abby. I'm an upcoming sophomore, and I'm an AET major. I'll go next. I'm Josh. I <laughs> just finished up my freshman year, and I'm an AET major, too. I'm Bronwyn. I am a rising junior, and I'm a public relations major. And I'm Claire. I'm a rising senior, and I'm a social work major. Cool. Um, I'll, I'll be the one that asks the questions. Um, so yeah, we're doing the Socratic seminar style. And the first question is, why did you choose a certain quote to describe the concept of Ubuntu? Um, someone else can go. <laughs> So for me, I chose uh, one of the Desmond Tutu quotes from the Michael Battle book. And it said that a person with Ubuntu is open and available to others, affirming of others, and does not feel threatened that others are able and good for he or she has, self or proper, pro uh, has proper self assurance that comes from knowing he or she belongs in a greater whole. And I really liked that uh, to describe Ubuntu because that's kind of like the mindset that someone has to have to carry out the ideals of Ubuntu. And it's not a reiteration of, of the ideals. I kind of like the uh, application of it, like in our world. I liked the part about not feeling threatened about other people being able and good. I think that's a mindset that kind of American society as a whole needs to more fully like realize that just because someone else is doing well at something doesn't mean you can't also do well at it. Like you don't need to like beat everyone else at like out of something to be successful at it. Kind of like the the competition that comes from kind of like the capitalism thing that we kind mm -hmm. of went pretty deep into. Yeah, it's almost as a, and I know like we'll talk about the Trevor Noah book later, but like it's almost like when um, he describes like the different tribes kind of being set up to like fight against each other almost um, and like, that kind of was like they were their own oppressor, oppressor in that way. It's like similar ish, not to the point of like murder in the streets or anything, obviously, but like um, to that where it's like we're so individualistic because our system was set up to force us to be individualistic and competitive and like fight against each other constantly and like view each other as like competition and not as like a part of this holistic community um yeah yeah I, yeah and like with apartheid i mean they literally had sections of the country based on you know what language you spoke if you're a black or white and like you said even the black people were were segregated amongst themselves um but yeah the way that i described ubuntu is the quote, Ubuntu is the environment of vulnerability, a set of relationships in which persons are able to recognize that their humanity is bound up in the other's humanity. Um, and I just, I think about like, like we are again, so individualistic. So we forget all the things that like shape us as we grow up. Um, and I also wrote like, I want to be that person for someone else. Like if you think about all the teacher, like maybe there's a certain teacher that shaped how you write or shaped how you think about science or something. Um, it would be, you know, like part of Ubuntu is not only like taking that from someone else, but giving it back out to the community. So yeah. Um, the next question is, what was your biggest takeaway from Born a Crime? I was really struck by what a powerful woman his mother was, like just the things that she was capable of doing, like with her background and how she brought, how she brought her son up, like the part about how everyone else was criticizing her about showing him things that like white people were supposed to do, like going to the movies and going ice skating. 
And when she said that she wanted him to know that there was a world outside of where they lived, she didn't want his thinking to be trapped in where they were. She wanted him to know that there was a million things out there and that you were capable of doing anything. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Oh, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Josh. (laughs) Uh, I was just going to say, like, on top of that, like, just with all the social pressure on her especially having a mixed child and her being black like that was hard enough for her to be like out and about just normally but for her to be like like you said in the movie theaters the ice skating rinks like the white churches like I think that definitely like showed her courage and bravery and like how she just really didn't care for apartheid yeah looking at like reading about his childhood and like um especially from like I guess, like, the social worker perspective. I don't want to be like, I'm a social worker major, but I am. Um, And so just looking at through that, like, Trevor Noah should have, like, so many, like, issues based on, like, all these, like, adverse childhood experiences he had um, growing up. But he had all this resilience kind of brought on by his family and, like, especially by his mother where his mother was, like, such a rock, which just – like, the way that she supported him, and, like, it was just so surprising to me, like, how much he's been through, and, like, watching him now, like, on TV, or, like, reading this book, even, I'm just, like, so surprised by, like, how well he's over, been able to overcome all of those, like, aces, is what they're called, um, so, I don't know. That was just a really amazing, like, that stood out to me a lot, too, as well. Like, how he, like, how his mother, like, raised him and, like, kind of cultivated all of this resilience within him. I don't know I why this, like, like, stuck with me. Sorry. This, like, stuck go. with me when um, he, he talked about his mom, like, when she was growing up, she had a lot of siblings, and she was like her family was so hungry she would drink muddy water just to fill up her belly and I was like for her to come from that poverty and to bring up her child like she couldn't even marry the guy that she loved uh, because of apartheid and she still wanted a child and she did she like taught him amazing things it's just really cool how she like can't really did come from nothing and made something for her child um so really strong woman, go her. Go ahead, Bronwyn. Sorry, yeah, I um, wanted to add the part about when he was talking about how he was raised in a world that sh- shouldn't have happened during apartheid, during apartheid, but it set him up for when it ended. Like his mother had no idea that that was gonna end and there was no like way of knowing that because it had gone on for generations. But he said he found it amazing that, like, she had set him up to go in a world, like, outside of that and believe that he could do anything. I think he described it as, like, a white man's mentality. He wasn't raised as white, but he was raised in the white man's mentality of you can do anything and accomplish anything. All you have to do is, like, go out and accomplish it. And I feel like that's something that, like, I didn't think about before just because of where I grew up, like, it was never, like, I couldn't do anything I wanted to do, so I think that was a big, like, realization for me, like, throughout it, that, like, not everyone grows up with people telling them, like, you can do whatever you want to do, because you have the means to. And I think, like, a lot of Trevor Noah, and, like, the way he is, who he is, like, there was definitely, um, a lot of like subliminal hints of Ubuntu throughout his like the communities he grew up in and like when they're describing um oh, I can't even remember he related one of the neighborhoods that he lived in to the favelas in Rio it was like kind of oh, a vision right. and like the way he described the whole um economy or arrangement or just the way they did everything like it was very Ubuntu like like whenever a mother needed anything, like everyone stopped what they were doing, like they'd stop selling drugs or whatever they're up to and go help her. So I thought that was really cool. And it 
seems like his mom really kind of reinforced that in him with like the experiences that she gave him while they were while they were like growing up while he was growing up. Yeah, um, I in the Go Hitler chapter where his friend's name is Hitler, um, which which is also crazy because people in South Africa would name their kids Hitler, not knowing the history they would just know that was a strong figure so they would name their dogs or their kids but i really like the part where like trevor he's like making these like throughout the story he's of course funny but he's also telling like truths so when he's explaining how his white friend andrew empowered the dispossessed and disenfranchised in the wake of oppression. Um, and this was when Andrew gave Trevor uh, his CD writer. And then if you just think about Trevor's whole life after that, um, then he started making his own money and he had his own business. He was a capitalist. I mean, and that was all from just a few resources that he otherwise wouldn't have had. So even there, he's kind of like, and like you watch him on The Daily Show, he is pretty liberal. Um, so it's just interesting because you can see that like he needed that one resource and from there he took off because that was all he needed. He had the work ethic and everything. So yeah, you can tell there he's, he's talking about resources. Um, and sometimes people just need to get up, get on their feet again. So I think that was really good that he put that in there. Yeah, I think he added that little part to the analogy of like, give a man a fish and you'll feed him for a day, teach a man how to fish and you'll feed him for a lifetime. But it doesn't help if you don't give him a fishing rod to mm -hmm. do so. And yeah. I think that was like a really powerful analogy that really helped me grasp the concept of what he was trying to say. Yeah. And I really like how you kind of used like everything you guys just said um, to make everything way more comprehensible by Americans and like the West, which is main from what I understand with the books like audience was for the most part. All right, um, we'll move on to the two economies post. So the question is, what is your definition of economy versus the great economy? So one of the main differences that I discerned between the two was um, the one sees humans as the only participant and kind of controlling everything and like bending everything to their will while the great economy includes everything as a component of life all working together to create things. And I really liked um, his use of the topsoil as like if you view it as soil, it's not going to be able to flourish but if you work with it and like help nurture it it will provide um the nutrients for you to get the best crops possible so i thought that was a really good kind of component to that i guess i didn't really like have a good definition but kind of going off of that um with well, like using your resources more effectively. I think that's what, at least like in our own little economy, like the way that we spend our money. Um, a lot of people, at least in the US are very wasteful. Um, like you think about, um, like in our paper, we talked about um, the environment and um, the, marketplaces or the local farmers markets that's what it was but it's crazy because we spend all this money for these big agriculture companies to take the fruit off of the trees before it's ripe and then have it travel thousands of miles to our grocery stores when in reality we could just go to a farmers market pay less money the small businesses would thrive and we would get fresh food so it's kind of like this thing where like we're we're buying into 
capitalism, which is good, but you also have the power to have your own, like, your own purchasing decision and be like, if I want to support this farmer's market because I know that it's good for our community, that I'm going to do that. Um, I just think it's a good mentality of like, think about your purchasing power um, and what do I want to support with my money? So that's kind of what I'm getting out of the economy and being more aware of what you're contributing to the great economy. But yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that like similar, like the, again, like the capitalist like mindset has like set up this competition, which in this, like in the economy case, I think is a good thing. Like I think that there should be competition within like companies and stuff like that, I guess. Um, because that helps whatever the healthy like market and that helps us get, have more of a choice as consumers. Um, but yeah, I think there is also instances where it's kind of set up against like the consumers where like people will live in like food deserts and their only option is the Walmart, you know, 20 miles down the road. Um, if they can get there and, or, and if not, they just have to go to the McDonald's down the street because there will always be a McDonald's down the street because McDonald's targets those populations where they sleep <laughs> and like they go in there and they're like okay like you have to eat this now and there's like this huge obesity rate because of that in impoverished communities and particularly in food deserts um so I think that I think it was in um Dr. Dark's writing where he said something about um the economy like as it is kind of destroys what it doesn't understand where it's like it doesn't get like poverty in this instance it doesn't understand it and so it just kind of ignores it and in turn because it's ignoring it it is destroying that population of people and I don't know that was just a very interesting thing I feel like that's what we're in right now and like we're kind of stuck in it almost like I feel like every time I see like the economy like in the news headlines and stuff I'm like I don't feel like there this is something we can change or this is something we can fix I feel like this is just a thing that is affected by us as consumers but like it is way too far out of reach for us to actually change anything for the better um and so like just reading that like the economy should be a people's choice and like it shouldn't be like this thing that destroys the thing it doesn't understand it should embrace it and adapt to it and i think that that would really be the like great economy so that was really good <laughs> i personally like that kind of reminded me of a quote um from michael battle where he or actually is from albert borgen borgman within the battle book and he says, technology is not just a tool, but induce, an inducement so strong, most people are unable to refuse it. Mm -hmm. And like that kind of leads to like the, a lot of the issues you're talking about in capitalism, like where technology has driven grocery stores to be a better option because we can order it online and stuff like that. And it's, it's just come to a point where it's become more of a, like something that's maybe not the best thing rather than its yeah. intention and i kind of see the great economy like through the it's like he said is the kingdom of god and it, we have to be considerate of the earth and people around us with every action or like everything that we do and i kind of personally see it like the economy is more of a communal perspective and like like you know there's different economies different cultures throughout the world and like those have to function so i think like every economy or arrangement should address the priorities of the communities uh like what they need to get done and then like sustain their well-being and that kind of thing rather than um it being because like the great economy i really like it i just feel like it's it feels hard to apply you know like especially like to america like a change like that would be really interesting but yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I feel like looking at it that way, I feel like a lot of the time we want like one solution that's going to like fix everything. 
but every situation is so different and even within America there are so many different situations happening that like it's not going to be one thing that changes it it's going to be like catered to each specific community and what they can do to better everyone in their community exactly all right the next thing next question is about the demon's mouth and the chother reading each other i don't know how to say it but the question is where have you observed the self-attribution fallacy in your life and how could it be changed by the ideas seen throughout this course i actually missed this question so someone else go <laughs> Personally, like, I kind of see the self-attribution fallacy, like, um, in any of my skills or, like, any strengths or whatever. Like, the example that came to me offhand was, like, my cooking skills. Like, I'd congratulate myself for that or whatever, but I wouldn't devote enough gratitude to, like, uh, per se, like, a cooking teacher I had in high school or my parents or anything like that. And to kind of just, like, all of the skills we have or any of our strengths that we've built up over time. Like we kind of, we should probably congratulate the people who helped us achieve that or whatever helped us achieve that and not just give ourselves all the credit. Yeah, the thing I related to most like within the story was the um, surfboard story that he told where he was like literally drowning but didn't want to ask for help because he didn't want to be weak. But then he was like, I need help, but like still didn't want to do it. And I feel like a lot of, times like in my life and I feel like just in a lot of people's lives they don't want to ask for help because they don't want to be seen as weak and I feel like in our culture like if you stand alone and get everything done by yourself that's seen as like a really good thing and I feel like instead people should see like community and working together as like better than accomplishing everything on your own so I think that just like Ubuntu principle of community and working together for the greater good is something that I want to apply more so in my own life because I feel like I've always been taught the mindset of like get it done yourself um, to make it the best possible but it's better to have help along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah I definitely like in my own life I attribute to like my politics like I don't I guess acknowledge the people who have gotten me to where I am in my like political view and like social world world view and like like my parents are both very 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 liberal people and I am also a very very liberal person and like I grew up in this church that like emphasizes social justice and like all these things that I value so so deeply and I'm still kind of like I don't credit that enough I guess with like sorry my cat just jumped up um, I don't like credit my or the people around me for kind of like crafting this for me and like especially when I see like other people here she is um, <laughs> like who didn't necessarily grow up in within like the environments that I was so lucky to grow up in and like they still have to do all they have to do all this work to get to the point of like social justice or whatever um, I'm like I didn't have to do that work so in some ways I'm kind of like missing out but also like I just I don't know I'm rambling now but yeah I didn't like I don't appreciate the people around me and the communities around me that I was surrounded with growing up that kind of attributed to like my empathy and my like social justice like those things being at the forefront and now it's like literally my major so yeah Sorry. yeah I that's interesting that you brought that up because like your background because when I was reading your guys's posts introducing each other um like Claire I was like reading yours about um it's called the Unitarian Church right mm -hmm. I was like that's so cool that they teach you about world religions and that just starts a good foundation of like it's not teaching one way is the right way it's just saying here are like a bunch of options that other people have found successful like I thought that was a really cool way to do it I know there's more to it than that but um 
I guess just like it's one of those things like the way people grow up they they're used to it but then you see other people's and you were like always comparing but but anyways I could go I could talk about yeah. that um and then one this while you guys were talking about like community and asking for help um I thought of this little thing um it, like I was in marching band in high school and we do leadership like team and I wanted to be on the leadership team and they do interviews so I was in my interview with the band director and he was like grilling me with questions about like what I would do in certain situations and he asked me something like some kind of drama situation in the band and he was like what would you do and I was like and I just started telling him how I would handle it myself and he's like, well, and he, what, he wouldn't tell me the answer. He was just like trying to get me to say, he, he knew what answer he wanted. He wanted me to say, <laughs> ask for help, like ask the directors, like you can't deal with other people's drama all on your own. And I, I was getting really frustrated because I didn't know what he was trying to get me to say, because that's just not how I handle things. I try to do everything myself. So he finally told me what he was like looking for and I was like okay but it was it was kind of like a really big lesson in my life um about like it's a leadership team it's not just like apply for a position and that's your position like it's okay to ask other people or like if if you know this one person is really good at teaching a certain part of marching band ask them for help. If you know someone needs help, you don't have to do everything yourself. So yeah, that goes into the each other topic. Um, and the next thing, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say like a lot of what um, you and Claire were saying about just like the people that shaped you to who you were and kind of, I guess what me and Vaughn had said too, what all of us said was like, I feel like I wonder if that kind of has to do with how much we acknowledge people when they're helping us out with stuff like whether we're going to remember them or not based on like whether or not in the moment when it's happening when we like acknowledge like hey this person was helping me or this person was doing this for me and like kind of acknowledging like your growth as well and not just like you know falling into the trap of giving yourself all the credit yeah and then, yeah, I mean, how are you going to grow if you only give yourself credit? I mean, exactly. you have to be like, there's things I can work on and I know who to ask for help, that kind of thing. But You got to get your knowledge from somewhere. <laughs> the next thing is our capitalism paper. And the question is, what did you learn from the essay? So I think, oh, sorry. Not, Do you want to yeah. go? Or, okay. Um, I think the main thing that I took away from is I have always thought of capitalism as like this bad thing and what I've kind of realized is that it's a tradition that like can't be inherently bad it's what people do with it and so it's just an ideology and people gain things from it and act a certain way because of it but it doesn't have to be bad like capitalism has done a lot of great things and it just kind of isn't inherently bad. That was my main takeaway from the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, like I was gonna say very similar, like when it's seen as a tradition and not as like an evil thing, like we can, like it can be used to an advantage, right? Like rather than seeing it as an economic system, like we see it as like, like we um, define it as a sacred tradition. And like if it's seen as a sacred tradition that people mold their lives around, like people in America, for example, like strongly value freedom. And a lot of that's through capitalism, like free enterprise and that kind of thing. But it's like, w when you think of like Buddhism forming India, I don't know if that's how it went down or like a Christian country in Europe um, in the 1600s. Like it's all being, everything's being formed around a religious tradition and that's how they execute their day-to-day -day lives. And I feel like if we look at capitalism like that, it can be more understanding and we don't just have like the whole I hate capitalism 
vibe because then like you're just hating on the same tradition that people adore and it's just going to create a larger divide yeah I think it's really interesting especially after like the recent like um democratic primaries or that just went like happened in like all those debates where it's like we have this full spectrum of like total fallen like capitalist people who were like you know joe biden's and like amy klobuchar's of the world who were like we like this system <laughs> like this is it to like bernie sanders who was like no i'm a socialist and like he was very okay with that label and like very like into that label totally anti-capitalist i think it's just an interesting thing to like examine especially since like I feel like me watching that before like this class even started I was like I felt like that same like I guess like animosity towards capitalism where I was like ah it's not good bad boo like <laughs> and so um I really have the words today um and so I like writing this essay and like especially trying to like because like I know we were trying so hard to like not make it seem like that because we wanted to be like um totally unbiased in that it was really I think good for me to realize that capitalism isn't the evil it's like the driving force in all these evils where it's like capitalism isn't what caused the 13th amendment to be written the way it was but it drove people to write what the 13th like that exception in the 13th amendment that allows for slavery within incarcerated um people and so i think it's just if we look at those individual things that capitalism caused like that greed that it kind of caused um the unmonitored greed especially where it's like we are not doing this ethically we're just doing it because we want more and more and more and more um if we look at it and see and say okay capitalism with morals though this time and like with ethics and like without like with like we're gonna watch it that now i think that that's like just an interesting perspective that was brought to my mind i guess writing this paper yeah like of course capitalism isn't bad like yeah like america is has a good economy well that's debatable but <laughs> We have a big debt, but, um, <laughs> of course, capitalism isn't bad. Like, we have a market that's working, unless the virus, but besides that, um, <laughs> if you look at alternative countries, like, that are not capitalist, you, they do sacrifice a little freedom, and, like, I don't know if it was Bronwyn or Claire that said, like, we value freedom, um, I'm not sure who said that, but we value freedom in the choice, like in the choice of, again, purchasing power. So, and owning your own things and being able to sell your own things to whoever you want, whoever's going to pay the most. Um, but yeah, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, oh with like Claire said ethical capitalism like and that goes to the point of electing people that we feel share the same values and that will put into effect what we want within the system we already have so yeah go vote kids um <laughs> and I feel like um capitalism and apartheid like they're similar in some ways that uh I shouldn't compare it to apartheid necessarily, but they both have uh, things that they've done to mainly like minority communities, or I guess an apartheid majority community. But like uh, we were writing about healthcare and the environment and how all these in prison labor and how people are so disadvantaged from like the ideals of capitalism. And like same with apartheid, like some people are advantaged, but most people were disadvantaged. and. It's just the way it's things are executed and the priorities that are laid out before. I had something cool to say about it, but I kind of forgot it, so we could move on. <laughs> or <laughs> someone will say something. Okay. Um, oh, and then our yoga essay. Um, what did you guys learn from 
our essay on yoga. I feel like I, I learned, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna. I feel like I learned more uh, importance importance about rituals and culture than I did, and like how to be careful and like uh like just the importance of like carrying out a tr a sacred ritual of a different tradition that you don't really identify with or follow. So like when we use uh, yoga in the tradition of capitalism or whatever context in the West, it we kind of have to do it with the acknowledgement of where it came from. We don't necessarily have to do it just like the Buddhists or the Hindi or the, or the Hindis or um, um, Jainists did, but we, we can do it in a way that sort of honors them and carries it forward. And we just need to be careful to like not use sacred rituals in a way that's offensive, I guess, towards their origin. Like they don't have to be the exact same way, but like when we say, like I read something like if we, when we say namaste, like at the end of a class, like that's how they say I bow to you to like as a greeting to a, um, a person of high honor. So like it's just kind of stuff like that, that you can see where the anger comes from. And I feel like that can just be prevented by just educating ourselves mm -hmm. and that kind of thing before we yeah. participate in a sacred ritual. Yeah, I feel like with a lot of... Um like appropriation, um, cultural appropriation, it's like this really weird, like, is it okay? Like, is what I'm doing right now okay? Like, or is there a problem with it? And it's like, I think we expect these groups to have this like group think mentality of like, they're all this one brain where they can like answer this yes or no. But it's such a gray area in so many cases. Like, I read like a couple articles where like Jane yoga is so like it's not practiced that often anymore um even within the Jane tradition and so they're kind of like yeah practice yoga practice Jane yoga over there in America please because we feel like it's we're losing it almost and so it was just like an interesting I guess di the different perspectives of it of like whether or not it's appreciation versus appropriation and I think it's really just like one of those things that's like it's for the user to decide almost like and like research and like understand um I think I expected like right going into the essay I expected there to be like this clear-cut like yes or no black and white answer but it's so much more like complicated than that which I think is true of all like cultural appropriation. So with all yeah. these traditions, it's hard to like oops sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. But like there's all these different traditions with like I don't know, they don't have a spokesperson, I guess. So what you're saying is like really right. you know, like it's hard to decide. Right. There's no Jane Pulp up there like in the Vatican, <laughs> <laughs> like being like, yeah. ah, this is right. <laughs> yeah, and but then I think about different. Sorry. <laughs> then I think about the um, gentrification issue and um, it's a huge issue, but like, I don't know how, like, how do you even tackle something like that? Because it's like, again, capitalism, like people with money can come in and just like buy what they want and change it how they want. So I mean, I don't know how to tackle that. I don't know if there's policy for that, but it's tragic. I've, I've like watched, I forgot. It's like a short film about Seattle, um, Seattle, Washington. And it used to like the suburbs of Seattle used to be a very black area and a thriving black area with all kinds of, of businesses that were thriving. Um, but then of course appropriation and well not appropriation gentrification comes in and a lot of you know trader joe's and yoga studios pop up and white people buy up the houses but I, yeah have you got do you guys know like how like is there policy that helps or like is there any way that we can do anything <laughs> nope <laughs> no, no that's not true um it's just slow process sometimes it's really hard to identify like yeah, for example like Bel like belmont is so gentrified like that whole 12 south community because like you know you cross the street and it's black and white like 
you know, it's it's that kind of thing where, you know, we we're all like we all live by Belmont, like we're part of the gentrification process. But like in some ways, like it's kind of unavoidable, you know, like and it's it's really sad. And like there has to be more policy. Sorry, I went on a little political right there, but like no. you know, we need we need something to protect these sacred communities with their own cultures and not make them be homeless because we have a better idea. Yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, like, if like going off that Belmont point, um, I don't you know that new apartment build complex that just popped up like on twelfth south, it's like twelfth and Wedgwood, I think it's called. Yeah, crossing the smoothie king. So, yeah, yeah. Super fancy place. It's that's affordable housing. That's government housing. Like that's like government it's eight hundred dollars a month to live there. Really? in like a studio apartment and it's government housing and it's just like that's not it like you know like that's just like so expensive and like not if you look at the median income and like what they're what these people who are literally like five minutes down the road are able to spend on housing like it's not eight hundred dollars a month (laughs) and it's not eight hundred dollars a month for most of Nashville citizens and like Antioch and all these other places surrounding Nashville Ah, okay, I'm gonna stop going on this rant, but like, it's just so, and it's so hard to like look at and be like, this is gentrification. Like, you are doing this until it's too late. Like, that apartment building complex popped up and they were like, it's gonna be affordable housing. It's great. Like, we're going to like help the homeless community in Nashville. And it's like, okay, but you're not. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, that's just not if, what's happening. If one business goes out of business and is bought up by, a more affluent company or something like it's different when it's one one place but then like it starts like going downhill very quickly it's like a domino Uh, effect so yeah I don't know that's something that's like really interesting that we have to think about and people have to know about like I was telling my mom she just she didn't know what gentrification was so my dad didn't either it was really interesting and like those people, those ages, they are the ones making the policies. So, uh, <laughs> exactly. Anyways, yeah, yeah. You know, that's a really good point. Like, like, if you don't know what it is, I mean, how can you? If you haven't experienced something, how can you make a law about it? Like, how can sixty dudes make a law about abortion? <laughs> it's true. No- yep. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, and it's just so interesting because, like, if you're homeless, you don't have an address. You can't vote, right? So it's not like, it's not even like if you have been affected by this, like, you can be sure that you're, like, able to affect change and, like, go out and go vote like everyone tells you to do. Wait. And then gets mad at you for not doing. Hmm? Homeless people can't vote if they don't have a house? You have to have an address to register to vote because you have to vote within your precinct, right? Oh. Uh, so you have to have an address. It has to be I verifiable. Just like registered once and you're solid. Nope, because um yeah, right. there's a whole <laughs> whole thing. Like if you're home if you've ever had a felony charge, which like impoverished people, like there's like the broken windows policing, um, where cops are just they're there, like they're watching you like hawks, like if you do a single thing wrong. Like, and like black, but. yeah <laughs> like and so it's just if you have ever had a felony like in most states in most areas you cannot vote and it's like that's all the you that's all the people that are affected by this and like should be the ones voting right because they should be the ones who are they are the ones who like know what's going on and see it especially in areas like nashville or like South Carolina, or like in the South, like it's like, they're the ones that are so disproportionately affected by it, and you're like shirking their right to vote, which is a right, not a privilege. I could keep going. And then how could like ideals of Ubuntu be carried out if like those priorities- That's what I was thinking, yeah, Yeah, right. Like, you know, they have problems that aren't being prioritized because they have no representation. So how are their issues going to get out there if, like, the people in their areas being voted for by white people who just took over their community, you know? Like, yeah. It's, it's kind of just, like, 
a downhill issue. It's, and, it's not going to get better without some sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that yeah. kind of goes, sorry, go ahead, Roman. I'm not gonna... Oh, sorry, I was going to say that if we, like, use those principles, like, because we have the ability to vote and, like, a lot of power in these situations, we can use it to help, like, the community as a whole and have more of a mentality of what's going to be the best for everyone around us instead of just, like, ourselves or our, like, little, like, internal community within everything. Exactly. Yeah. And those are our opinions on yoga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was kind of surprised. Like, I thought yoga was going to be a much bigger deal in gentrification. And I, I think the movie you referenced earlier, I think, was it called Priced Out? Um, I don't, maybe? A gentrification? Because I remember watching something like that. I forget if it was in Portland or Seattle. But I think like, think, yeah, yeah, we might be thinking about the yeah. same thing. It was a yeah. combo. It was like, con yeah, it was combo. A combo. Yeah, yeah I a, did that one too. Yeah. I didn't watch the whole thing. I got the hundred. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I finished my combo in like twenty minutes. Anyway. <laughs> same. <Yeah. laughs> anyway, <laughs> but like yoga, I feel like it's more of like a sign that gentrification has always happened. Like we can't point at yoga studios for causing gentrification, obviously, but it's kind of like a like a reality check in so many ways. Like it's there's a good example, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there like is this... Sorry, go ahead, Bronwyn. Sorry. I feel like what it was cool because it, the essay brought us to, like, places that it didn't. we didn't think it was going to go, and I feel like we learned, mm -hmm. like, a lot of different things that we didn't think we were going to, like, encounter. So that was Definitely. a cool aspect. Sorry, go ahead, Claire. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, there was this... I wish I could find it again, but I don't have access to the course anymore. But in my third year writing class, this um, student wrote about how we're meant to do like maps of Nashville. Um, and so the student wrote about like yoga studios popping up in Nashville and how like there is like, as soon as a yoga studio popped up, the like price of rent jacked up. And like mm -hmm. most of the times it was in areas that like didn't have like, um, like a fixed rent or anything like that so it was just like these people just got like excuse my language I guess but screwed <laughs> like over totally like effed and like I don't know it's just very interesting to see like the statistics and like the map of that where like okay this yoga studio popped up five years ago and now that like is no longer an impoverished community that is now a community of like million dollar like apartments and like where did that come like how did that happen and it's just so insane one it happens so fast but yeah anyway. like one of the other well, like we should probably move on from this but the um the other thing and i think it was priced out it's interesting the lady that was doing that was doing most of the interviews um at least she like she had a home when she owned a home um at least then like the the value of the home is going up but at least you can still live there if you're not like paying well i don't know if mortgages go up but the point is if you are renting an apartment and the rent just keeps going up and your wage is not going up then you really are forced like you have no choice mm -hmm. um so i thought that was interesting like people that are in apartments versus owning a home but after like throughout this whole class um it is a religion class but we have like looked at a lot of political things too which is really important um so the last question is how has your view of religion changed after a course i think that like my religion um unitarian universalism relates a lot to ubuntu in some like ways like we have like these seven principles that are just like basically just respect each other and like let everyone live their own life but also like contribute to the community and like fight for social justice and like make sure that everyone is going to be like strive for this like peaceful like great life um and so I think it's kind of like giving me a bigger passion and like a different lens to view my religion in I've, like, been raised Unitarian Universalist, so, like, 
I feel like it just kind of gets old after a while almost where I'm just like oh yeah like it's it is what it is like it's a cool religion like we're all a bunch of hippies going to church and but then it's like seeing it through the lens of Ubuntu has kind of helped me like refresh my like passion and like my love for it and like for um those seven principles that we do and like yeah I've just grown more Unitarian Universalist through this class yeah I really liked reading your intro about that because I've always like I grew up Christian and I still go to the Christian church but I've also always like struggled with the idea that like if my like religion is right then everyone else has to be like wrong like they can't like all exist in harmony and I feel like that was a really cool concept of yours that like everyone like deserves their own beliefs and like who am I to say that like my god is the correct um like entity or whatever so Mm -hmm. that's something that I thought was really cool about that and just kind of throughout the whole course like you can learn things from other religions and appreciate things about them and apply them to your own life and just because they're different from the beliefs that you grew up with doesn't mean you don't have something to learn from them. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, um, I can talk about like my response. Um, Like, yeah, I was raised Christian, but it wasn't super, it wasn't super consistent. So like, I was always questioning, like, who am I, who am I worshiping, like, why am I praising this person, and I don't, like, understand who it is, or what they're going to do that's going to change anything, but, yeah, I've struggled with that, and I think after reading um, Practicing Islam in Short Shorts, I really like that, because, like, that's a very, like, even just with the dress, like, the way the women dress, it is a choice, but if you don't wear the hijab, then it's like, you may get judgment. You most likely will get judgment from traditional Islam people. So it's like this whole traditional thing where like people in our generation aren't, I mean, really any young person is not, they're always going to question the older generations and start wondering like, well, what can I do different? Like, what if I don't, what if I don't agree with that? Um, and I just really liked how she put it, like, like, this is, like, this is how I'm choosing to practice Islam. I am, is like, she's accepting that and practicing it for what works for her and her values. Um, and even the thing, like, praying every day, like, feeling, feeling obligated, and if you don't, you feel guilty. It's like, you shouldn't feel guilty like, that shouldn't be a thing, like, if you hear from people about Catholic guilt, it's like, (laughs) you shouldn't feel guilty for not doing what people are telling you to do, it's a religion, like, I just, I think that was a really valuable article to read, um, about, like, leading your own, your own path of, like, what you want to believe. Definitely. And like, you have to be really careful with who you let educate you about your, about the tradition that you're practicing. Cause like, you know, people can go to the same church and then have completely different religion. You know, like we all can kind of like hop on like a religion boat. I guess that's kind of what I learned the most from this class is like, it's like nobody can practice the same religion and Mm -hmm. we all have our own values like set of beliefs I guess like some people do like that have a very like unit pack mindset like you know pack walls mindset and where they all they're all in for the same thing they believe the same things and like you know there's different ways that it's executed but like anyway like people can either like hop on a boat like join a church and agree with everything they hear not question every anything or they can you know like steer their own boat like you can still go to a go to whatever church gather with whoever but like you educate yourself and you like decide what you want to believe because like personally like I grew up um, around in like the Baptist church like the Southern Baptist church more specifically and there's just a lot of like politics and like 
racial and like LGBTQ stuff I really did not believe with believe in and like it was just like a common mindset where like I was just like I, I don't see how you guys can believe this and then say this that kind of thing I'm not going to go too deep into it but like just the point being that we can all decide for ourselves and like we can create I guess create our own religion yeah and follow what we believe and that's our religion it doesn't really have to be defined yeah that's a great ending note I love that (laughs) (laughs) yeah it was so awesome having you guys in my group like you guys were a great group honestly and I loved having like like I loved having the consistency of seeing your faces and like working together I think we got we learned a lot so Mm -hmm. thank you guys for being good (laughs) yeah good cool dynamic yeah that was (laughs) it's weird we never met in person but it's really yeah Yeah. (laughs) I feel like we're all gonna be on campus and we're gonna be like is that (laughs) 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 thank you Dr. Dark too. Yes, yeah. this is such a good time. There were so many That's interesting so things to sweet. read and reflect on. Yes, yeah. all the material has been really great. Yeah, this whole thing kept me so sane. I. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm gonna stop recording.